It was a Tuesday morning in Ohio, and it was time for Bob to die. There was no doubt that Robert Anthony Buell was a bad man. Nobody argued otherwise, not even Bob, who was strapped to a gurney waiting for his poison. There was no excuse for what he did to that woman at his house in Doylestown, the woman he'd abducted and raped. She was the one who brought him down. She escaped after he left for work, running to the neighbor's home, still naked, a handcuff dangling from one wrist. But Bob wasn't being executed for that crime. He was being executed for the murder of 11-year-old Krista Harrison. See, when the police descended on Buell's home after the woman escaped, they had discovered a mountain of evidence that connected Buell to Krista's murder, along with the murders of two other girls, Tina Harmon and Debbie Smith. But while Bob took responsibility for the rape, he claimed he was not the man who killed those girls. Warden James Haviland held a microphone over Buell's head and asked if he had any last words. Yes, I do, he said. Jerry and Shirley, I didn't kill your daughter. The prosecutor knows that. And they left the real killer out there on the street to kill again and again and again. Later, Bob's spiritual advisor, the Reverend Ernie Sanders, revealed that Bob had left a secret behind, the name of the real killer, which was contained inside the records and notes he left in his cell. After the execution, Sanders had packed all of those papers into a cardboard box the size of a child's coffin. Eventually, that box made its way to Scene Magazine, where I worked in 2004. I found it on a shelf above the copier. I opened the box. I read through the pages and pages of material inside, and what I found will haunt me forever, because I came to believe that the state of Ohio killed a man for a crime he did not commit when they executed Bob in 2002. This is The Philosophy of Crime, and I'm your host, James Renner. Let's begin with the simple facts. There have been 1,490 executions in the United States since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. Only 16 were women. During this time, 161 additional prisoners were scheduled for execution, but were exonerated before they could be killed. There are currently 2,743 people sitting on death row, waiting for their date with death. Executions are legal in 30 states and illegal in 20. Texas leads the pack with 558 executions. Virginia is in second place with 113. Crimes for which you can be executed in these 30 states include murder, treason, military sabotage, and aircraft hijacking. Prisoners can also be executed by order of the federal government for murder and also for spying drug trafficking, and the attempted murder of a witness or juror. The vast majority of developed nations have abolished the death penalty. Besides the United States, other countries who still carry out executions include China, Iran, North Korea, and Saudi Arabia. Those are the facts about capital punishment in the United States as of January 2019. Now, a little history. We were quick to get the killing started. The first legal execution in the New World occurred on December 1, 1607. Captain George Kendall had arrived with a group of settlers from Great Britain, a journey of four months across the ocean, to set up a colony on a swampy island in what is now Virginia. The settlement was called Jamestown, and its president was a man named James Ratcliffe, who did not get along with Kendall. One day in the fall of that year, the colony blacksmith started a fight with Ratcliffe. Life was treacherous back then, full of threats, from disease to hostile Native American tribes, and there was little patience for mutiny, so Ratcliffe sentenced the blacksmith to hang. A wise man will do what he can to avoid the noose, and the blacksmith saw an opportunity. He told Ratcliffe to spare his life, and in return he would reveal a conspiracy to overthrow Ratcliffe's authority, organized by one George Kendall. There is some evidence that Kendall may have been working as a spy for Spain. Whatever the case, the blacksmith's life was spared, and Kendall was promptly executed 
by firing squad. Executions were administered throughout the colonies for the next 150 years, but the law varied from place to place, as did the crimes for which the ultimate punishment could be exacted. People were executed for speaking to Native Americans and for stealing chickens. In 1789, the Eighth Amendment of the Bill of Rights prohibited cruel and unusual punishment, which some scholars believed should logically include executions. But the Fifth Amendment says killing a man for a crime is okay so long as there's a grand jury indictment and the due process of law is followed. Individual states began to abolish the death penalty in the 19th century. Michigan was first in 1846. In fact, Michigan has never executed a prisoner. More states followed. Then, in 1972, the Supreme Court heard the case of Furman v. Georgia. William Henry Furman was not a smart man. He had a sixth grade education. He was also black and living in the South. On August 11, 1967, Furman broke into the home of William Mick, got caught, and while trying to escape, tripped, and the gun he carried fired, killing the homeowner. Since the murder was committed in the act of another felony, burglary, Furman was sentenced to death. His case was eventually rolled up with several others that reached the Supreme Court in 1972. The court split five to four, deciding that, in these specific cases, the death penalty was cruel and unusual punishment. However, the majority could not agree as to why exactly the death penalty was cruel and unusual. Was it cruel and unusual always, or only in the way these particular cases were handled? Justices Stewart, White, and Douglas indicated that perhaps the cases before them ended in the death penalty because the defendants had been black. If that was the case, perhaps the death penalty could be constitutional if there was a way to ensure that race is never a factor. Justices Brennan and Marshall wrote that the death penalty was always cruel and unusual punishment regardless of how it's applied. The four justices who disagreed were Chief Justice Warren and Justices Blackman, Powell, and Rehnquist, who had each been appointed to their seats by Nixon. This decision by the highest court had an immediate effect on the country as a whole. Every prisoner sitting on death row had their sentence commuted to life. No new executions could take place. State governments immediately drafted laws to find workarounds. The idea many states came up with was what's called a bifurcated trial on capital cases, meaning the same jury would not have to consider the death penalty while considering a person's guilt. There would be a separate phase for sentencing. The hope was that this would make it harder to send a man to the chair just because he was black. Once these new laws were passed, all the conservatives needed was the perfect case to push through the courts again. They didn't have to wait long. On November 21st, 1973, Two men, Fred Simmons and Bob Moore, picked up a pair of hitchhikers while driving through Florida. The hitchhikers were Troy, Leon, Gregg, and Floyd Allen. And they are one of the reasons your parents told you to never pick up hitchhikers. Somewhere in Georgia, Gregg shot both men, robbed their corpses, and stole the car. He didn't make it far before police caught up with him. It was the perfect case for the death penalty. A cold-blooded double murder during a robbery. But more important, Troy Leon Gregg was not black. Gregg v. Georgia made its way to the Supreme Court on March 30th, 1976. This time, the Supreme Court justices voted seven to two in favor of Georgia, agreeing that the state could put Gregg to death for the murders. Racial bias, they believed, would no longer be a factor since the new laws allowed for mitigating circumstances to be heard during sentencing. But were they right? Did we fix the race problem? Well, since the death penalty came back in 1976, 509 African Americans have been executed, compared to 830 Caucasians. So it did work, right? I mean, we're killing more white people than black people, aren't we? Not so fast. According to the NAACP, African Americans make up 13% of the population of the United States, and yet they represent 42% of death row inmates. Also, they're like a bazillion times more likely to get the death penalty if they're black and the victim is white. So yeah, 
race is absolutely still a factor, and always has been. I gotta tell you what happened to Troy Leon Gregg, by the way. He did not go quietly into that good night. The day before his scheduled execution in 1980, Gregg made a daring escape from a Georgia state prison with three other condemned murderers. They saw through the bars of their cell and then dressed in clothes they'd made to resemble guard uniforms before walking onto a ledge outside and shimmying down a fire escape. But the Grim Reaper has a schedule to keep and Greg was long overdue. He was beaten to death in a biker bar later that night, his body dumped in a lake. Violent delights have violent ends after all. Ever since its comeback, the death penalty has been a divisive topic. 54% of Americans still support capital punishment. Retribution, it seems, has no political affiliation. Even the most liberal politicians are careful to not come out too strongly against it. Take a look at what happened to Michael Dukakis, the Democratic candidate for president against George H. Cougar Bush, during the debates in 1988. Holy hell, it was the very first question, too. The journalist Bernard Shaw asked Dukakis if he'd support the death penalty if his wife Kitty was raped and murdered. Now, for fuck's sake, Kitty was in the audience that night. Think about that for a second. Anyway, Dukakis said no, of course he would not support the death penalty and nothing would change his mind. Wrong answer. Way wrong answer, dude. Spoiler alert, folks. I'm against the death penalty. We'll get to the specifics of why soon enough, but if I were asked that question, if somebody asked me if I'd support the death penalty, if my wife was raped and murdered, you know what I'd say? I would say of course I'd want the man to die. I'd want to do it myself, with my bare hands. And if I couldn't, then you could put him in a rusty metal chair, please, and plug him in and, and let him cook. And this is exactly why the death penalty should not exist in a civilized society like the United States, because we should not act out of rage and retribution, because this country as a whole is better than its parts. Of course I'd want to kill this man. I'm human. But there should be laws in place to stop me. And by the way, fuck you, Bernard Shaw. Smart people have questioned the ethics of executions ever since philosophy was first invented. And that brings us, at last, to Socrates, or as Bill and Ted called him, Socrates. Socrates was born on Thargelion 6, 470 BC. That's something like late May, a long ass time ago. He grew up outside the city walls of Athens, the son of a sculptor. His mother was a midwife, so middle class, nothing too special, like having a contractor and a nurse for parents. As a young man, he worked in his father's business for a bit before joining the military. He served in the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. As you do, he returned from the war with questions. A lot of questions. This is the beginning of philosophy, the asking of questions. His process of getting to the truth by asking questions became known as the Socratic method. He believed everyone, in their hearts, in their soul, already knows the truth about the universe, certainly right from wrong at least, and if given the chance to think about these things, a person will find the answer on their own. This method of asking questions to get at the truth is still the core to the system of laws we use today. Socrates has some radical ideas about criminals. He believed that no one desires evil, that no one does wrong willingly, or knowingly. He believed that virtue is knowledge, and all a person really needs to be happy is virtue. Socrates spoke out against capital punishment in Athens. He said that one ought not return injustice for injustice, or do ill to any man, no matter what one may suffer at their hands. But what about in retribution or self-defense? Not even then, said Socrates. If it were necessary either to do wrong or to suffer it, I should prefer to suffer rather than do it. Sound familiar? At about this time and not far away, a young carpenter from Nazareth was telling people they should turn the other cheek too. But here's the frustrating thing about old Socrates, who looks a little like that scary being the crew of the Enterprise finds at the center of the galaxy in Star Trek V, or maybe a little like the cowardly lion from The Wizard of Oz. Where was I? Oh, right. Uh, Socrates never wrote anything down. He was paranoid about books and scrolls the way your uncle is paranoid about the internet. He thought reading made people stupider because they didn't have to remember anything, and it also opened their minds up to influence, 
the influence of the author who might be making everything up. All we have to go by are the books written by the young men who gathered around him while he walked around Athens stirring up trouble. Men like Plato and Xenophon. There's this fun little story that Plato wrote about the time his buddy Chariphon visited the oracle at Delphi to find out if anyone was smarter than Socrates. You should know a little bit about the oracle at Delphi because it comes up a lot in these old stories and also because it's creepy as fuck. The oracle was a person, a young woman, a psychic. You could find her at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, which was a good long journey from Athens, about 110 miles. You could go and ask her questions about the universe or about the future and she would spin around on the floor and speak in tongue and tell your fortune. It was just a casually accepted thing that if something was really troubling you, you could go to this witch and she would offer guidance. It was said that inside the temple was a laurel bush and inside that bush was a god and it spoke to the oracle by rustling its leaves. A few scientists have offered explanations for the oracle's abilities over the years. One theory is that the woman was getting high off ethylene fumes coming out of the water that ran beneath the temple. Tests of the water have turned up traces of the gas, which can be used as an anesthetic. Others believed she was chewing oleander to get high, which explains the writhing on the ground since oleander can cause convulsions. Wh whatever. Plato's friend Chariphon believed in the oracle and went to her and asked if anyone was smarter than Socrates, to which she said, no one was wiser. This troubled Socrates very much when they told him about it because he didn't think he was smart at all. He was just smart enough, in fact, to understand how much he didn't know about the universe. So he went around Athens asking politicians and poets and so-called smart people a bunch of questions. What he discovered was that these men were actually quite stupid because they believed they were smart. It was a paradox. Since Socrates was at least smart enough to realize how stupid he was, that made him the smartest man in Athens. It also pissed off those politicians. They thought he was making fun of them, and he probably was. Socrates didn't care what the politicians thought of him, really. He enjoyed talking to the teenagers and young men who gathered in the workshops outside the political center. They were more keen to listen to his discussions anyway. Socrates became pretty famous in Athens, something between like a Hank Green and a John Stewart, if you can imagine. He got to be about 70, which was quite old back then, and then he got in trouble for corrupting the minds of the youth. A couple of his students had kind of sort of overthrown the government for a bit. He was put on trial in front of 500 jurors. 280 of them found him guilty. At sentencing, Socrates was given the opportunity to suggest his own punishment, to which Socrates said he should be given free meals at the Prytaneum, which would be like saying, how about a gift certificate to Sasabun? This fucking guy, am I right? The jury prescribed death by poison. Socrates was given a cup of hemlock to drink. His final words were, Crito, we owe a rooster to Asclepius, don't forget. Yes, we executed the guy who invented philosophy, and the last thing he was concerned about was settling his debts. Personally, when it's time, I'd rather be like that old man from Ocean's Eleven. I want my last check to bounce. You know what grinds my gears? Many of the people who support the death penalty are also pro-lifers. Killing a fetus, not cool. Killing a grown-up, totally cool. Why? How does that disconnect happen? Supporters of capital punishment claim that it works as a deterrent. The criminals will think twice about raping and killing if they know they could be put to death because of it. And this is simply not true. Data provided by Amnesty International shows that murder rates in the 20 states that have already abolished the death penalty are consistently lower than in states with the death penalty. Studies have found that the idea that they might be executed at some future date isn't something murderers contemplate before killing, and that makes some sense when you consider the vast majority of people committing these horrible crimes are under the influence of drugs, or have serious mental problems, or are dumber than a box of rocks. So if it doesn't stop more murders from happening, the best argument for the death penalty is retribution. That guy killed someone, so he deserves to die too. And a very famous philosopher agreed with this. It surprised me when I learned this, actually, because that philosopher is Immanuel Kant, the man who gave us the categorical imperative. Remember, the categorical imperative says, 
act only according to the maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become universal law. If you apply the categorical imperative to capital punishment, you get people killing each other until there's only one left standing. So apparently, beyond being a total mood killer at parties, Kant was also a hypocrite. When his fellow philosophers talked about abolishing executions, Kant called them sissies and said they were blinded by sympathetic sentimentality and an affectation of humanitarianism. Kant believed real justice needed to be balanced. Let the punishment fit the crime, an eye for an eye. He goes on to say, if he has committed a murder, he must die. There is no sameness of kind between death and remaining alive, even under the most miserable conditions. And consequently, there is also no equality between the crime and retribution unless the crime is judicially condemned and put to death. It's hard to shut Kant up when he gets rolling. He even maps out what to do with capital punishment in the event of an apocalypse. Even if civil society were to dissolve, he says, the last murderer in prison would first have to be executed so that each should receive his just deserts. Damn, that's cold. Fun fact, Kant never had kids, which I think explains a lot. Children, even other people's children, teach us grace and forgiveness. My son forgot to feed his hamster yesterday. I'm still going to make him lunch. The United States justice system is based on retribution, or punishment, and as such, it makes sense that its highest crimes would carry the death sentence. But this is a very primitive form of justice that worked very well when we were living in huts and hunting and gathering. But maybe we've evolved a bit since then? Hopefully we have. The European Union system of justice focuses more on punitive equality, using a sliding scale of justice that is dependent on the quality of life of the perpetrator. For instance, there's the senior executive for Nokia who got a traffic ticket for driving 75 in a 50. The judge looked at his salary, which was $12.5 million a year, so he was fined $103,000. Ah, uh, but here in America, we bristle at that, right? That's not fair. That's not fair at all, because that could be us. Here in the United States, anyone can be a millionaire if we just pull up our bootstraps and get to work, and that could be us, right? And that's not fair. There's a famous quote that is often misattributed to John Steinbeck, but actually belongs to the author Ronald Wright. He said that socialism never took root in America because the poor see themselves not as an exploited proletariat, but as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. There are better forms of justice. One example is restorative justice. While retributive justice is concerned about suffering, restorative justice is concerned about peace. This is the idea of mitigation, of bringing the accused and the victim together to attempt to resolve their problems, for them to settle their debts on their own, respectful of one another. Because here's the thing, nobody ever sets out to do an act of evil simply because they are evil. Those characters only exist in James Bond movies. It's not real. Each of us desires something, and criminals believe the only way they can have it is to break the law. But these people, they are a product of their childhood. They are the sum of their experiences. Example, Ted Bundy was born at a home for unwed mothers and raised by his abusive grandfather, Samuel Cowell, for the first three years of his life. Cowell was a racist who beat his wife and swung cats around by their tails. Cal is also probably Ted's true biological father, which would make his mom his sister as well. Does this excuse his later behavior? No, but it puts it in a different context, doesn't it? It allows for the fact that perhaps Ted Bundy was not as in control of his behavior as someone who was raised in better circumstances. And this gets at a discomforting idea that each member of society shares a little responsibility for how a person turns out. Ted Bundy's mother, Ted's grandfather, certainly bears some responsibility. But what about the neighbor who heard the beatings and did nothing? The teachers who knew something was wrong but didn't look deeper? How many people turned their backs in young Ted before he became a killer? I believe we all share a little responsibility for how a child turns out. So how dare we put all that guilt on their shoulders when they act out? How can we possibly condemn a man to death after we've failed him so many times. <laughs>
The 30 states that still execute prisoners do so by lethal injection. In a couple states, the prisoner can request the chair or even a firing squad, but mostly it's lethal injection. Do you know how it works? I'll tell you. The morning of the execution, the condemned man is strapped to a gurney. His arms are swabbed with alcohol to prevent infection, a testament to the absurdity of the ordeal. IVs are inserted into each arm. The IVs are connected to saline drips. A heart monitor is attached to his body. Those IV tubes travel all the way into a little side room to the needles that contain three different poisons. Two staff members stand at separate stations waiting to push a button. Only one of the buttons tells the computer to release the poisons into the IV, and neither staff member knows which one does the trick, so they are free to assume they did not personally kill another human being. Most states use a three-poison cocktail of sodium thiopental, pancuronium bromide, and potassium chloride. They must be administered in a certain order. First comes the sodium thiopental, which renders him unconscious in less than 30 seconds. Next is the pancuronium bromide, a muscle relaxant which paralyzes the man and he stops breathing. This is extremely painful, but since he is unconscious, we don't hear his screams. Finally, potassium chloride, which stops the heart. In my state, Ohio, we only use one drug now, sodium thiopental. The man is given a very large dose that knocks him out and stops respiration. He slowly suffocates to death on the table. For anyone who wishes to consider how humane lethal injection is in the United States, I implore you to read the stories in the links provided on my YouTube page. There are too many horrible examples of botched executions for one episode, but let me share a couple from my home state in the past few years. Prison technicians worked for 22 minutes on Joseph Clark in order to find a vein for his IVs. Finally, they got one in, but after four minutes it collapsed and Clark's arms started swelling up. It don't work, it don't work, he said. Witnesses in the gallery reported hearing moaning and crying while the staff stabbed him repeatedly with needles to find another vein for a half an hour. Death was eventually pronounced after 90 minutes. In 2009, staff worked for more than two hours to find a workable vein in Rommel Broom's arms. After an hour of being stuck by needles, Broom himself tried to help his executioner find a good vein. Fuck, right? I mean, fuck. The governor called off the execution, and prison staff blamed the disaster on Broom's drug use. He is alive to this day and remains on death row. Just last year, Alabama tried to execute Doyle Lee Ham, a convicted killer who suffered from advanced lymphatic cancer. Staff worked for two and a half hours to find a vein. They stabbed him with needles in his arm, and when that didn't work, they tried his groin and accidentally punctured his bladder and cut into his femoral artery. They gave up only as a midnight deadline approached. Alabama Corrections Commissioner Jeff Dunn said, I wouldn't necessarily characterize what we had tonight as a problem. If you're looking for the definition of cruel and unusual punishment, I'd think stabbing a man's groin with a needle until his bladder is punctured is pretty high up there on that list. The thing that bothers me the most about capital punishment is that we very rarely know for sure that the people we're putting to death are guilty. They were only convicted because we believe them to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But doubt remains. Unless the murder is on camera, which it very seldom is, we're left to believe the evidence and eyewitness testimony, all of which can tell a different story than the real truth. Remember, in the United States, 161 people sitting on death row have been exonerated since 1976. Are we to believe all the rest of the people we put to death were luckily truly guilty? Come on. Surely we've executed innocent men. So we have to justify the fact that sometimes we execute innocent people so that we have the privilege of continuing to kill the real bad guys. The evidence suggested that Bob Buell killed Krista Harrison beyond a reasonable doubt. Krista was 12 years old when she was abducted from the park across the street from her house in 1982. Her body was found wrapped in plastic in a field six days later. On her body were several orange fibers. 
When Bob Buell was arrested after a woman escaped from his house after having been abducted and tortured, police found all they needed to link him to Krista inside. The fibers from her body had come from a roll of carpet in one of the bedrooms. The plastic she had been wrapped in was originally used to package the seats that Buell had installed in his van. Open and shut, right? Buell was executed for Krista's murder in 2002. His last meal was a single, unpitted olive. He thought an olive tree might grow out of his body and mark his final resting place. His final words were an admonishment. He said the prosecutors knew who the real killer was and then left him free to kill again. Everything in Buell's prison cell was packed up into an odd-sized cardboard box, and over time that box made its way to Scene Magazine, where I found it one day on a shelf above that copier. I took it home and opened it up. I felt a certain darkness in those personal things that Buell last touched, as if they contained extra gravity. It could well be my imagination, but it felt like a part of Buell was still in that box. There were reports and handwritten notes inside that suggested another man was responsible, at least in part, for what happened to Krista Harrison. At the time of Krista's abduction, Buell was not living at the house where all the evidence was found. His nephew was living there. The nephew drove a van that was the same make and model of Buell's van, and he had personally helped Buell install those seats and taken the plastic to the garbage. Buell had an alibi for the time that Krista's body was dumped in the field. His nephew did not. In fact, his nephew called in sick to work that day and showed up with his arm in a sling when he returned. My curiosity led me to the records room at Wayne County Common Pleas Court. In the basement there, I was given a roll of microfilm and sat at a machine in the corner. Unbeknownst to the clerk, there was grand jury testimony on that microfilm. Grand jury testimony is kept secret. It's illegal for witnesses to talk about it. What that grand jury testimony revealed was that the prosecutor was very much aware that Buell was not the best suspect for Krista's murder, and what he found was kept from the defense during the trial. Here's an excerpt. Buell's nephew is on the stand. The man questioning him is Assistant County Prosecutor Martin France. France had asked, can you tell us what you remember about Robert Buell and, and what he said when he was talking about these fantasies? The nephew replied, I would like to say something. It was me as well as him that was discussing whatever we were discussing. So both of you were talking about it? it yeah, it was a two-way conversation. Just tell us what Buell said, demanded France. Well, we would talk about it. You know, if we would pass up a girl or something on the street, talked about it, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have that girl for this evening? And I would say, yeah, sure would. Another thing that came out in those grand jury documents was that a fingerprint was found on the plastic used to wrap Krista's body. That fingerprint does not match Bob Buell. When I learned about this, I worked with the family of Tina Harmon to reopen her case. Tina Harmon was a 12-year-old girl who'd been abducted and murdered a year before Krista. She had those same orange fibers on her body, but her case had never been officially closed. When I asked the detective why they'd never charged Buell with her murder, since the evidence in the case was as good as it was in Krista's, he told me, you only have to kill a man once. The Harmon family asked the police to retest Tina's clothing for DNA, but they refused because the prosecutor said it would be too expensive. That prosecutor was Martin France the same guy who'd questioned Buell's nephew, and the test only cost $400. We held a press conference, and when the articles ran shaming the prosecutor, he relented and Tina's clothes were sent to the lab. The results came back fast. DNA on Tina's clothes matched to a sample they had obtained from Bob Buell. It proved that Buell was involved in Tina's murder, but it didn't prove he was alone and it didn't explain his alibi for the day Krista's body was dumped in that field. I tracked down Buell's nephew, of course. He was living in a suburb of Steubenville, not far from where 13-year-old Barbara Barnes was abducted in 1995. He worked as a cable installer. When I asked him why he'd taken off work the day Krista's body was found, he told me he'd hurt himself on the job. But I had already chased down that lead and confirmed with his work that that was not the case. He told me he must 
be confused since it was so long ago. A week after Krista's body was dumped, Buell's nephew left Akron in a hurry, quitting his job. No more girls were killed in Akron after he left. That investigation is the subject of the title story from my book, The Serial Killer's Apprentice. You can find it online, where, where books are sold. The one bit of good that came out of all of that was that I was able to close Tina's case and give her family a little bit of closure. It's the one case I've solved. A couple weeks ago, I was contacted by a girl who played softball with Krista Harrison. After the abduction, detectives learned that a man had come to her games and taken pictures of her from the stands. The detective showed her photos of Bob Buell, but she told them it wasn't the man with the camera. When she saw a photograph of Buell's nephew, she recognized him right away. His face is who I saw many years ago watching our softball games and taking photos of us, she wrote. I'd like to retest Krista's clothing to see if the nephew's DNA is on it, to see if his fingerprints match the one found on the plastic. But Wayne County destroyed all that evidence as soon as Buell was buried. The truth is buried with him. The Philosophy of Crime is a Fearful Symmetry production. This episode was recorded by Jeff Koval at the State Level Recording Studio in Fairlawn, Ohio. It was produced and edited by William Mankey. I'm James Renner. If you enjoyed this podcast, please visit jamesrenner.com, where you can find links to the other stuff I do, including virtual reality journalism. I also currently host Lake Erie's Coldest Cases for Discovery ID, and you can find every episode on idgo.com. My latest novel, Muse, will be published in May. You can order Muse and my other books online or anywhere books are sold. William Mankey also writes the music for this podcast. Check out his other creation, Genius Dice, wooden dice that will give an artful twist to your gaming night, available to order on Amazon or also woodif.com. Until next time, remember, there's a simple but challenging solution to the epidemic of crime. If everyone took the time to make good friends with their neighbors, we would know when someone needs our help before they become a statistic. Don't be fearful of the world. Make friends and make it better. Fuck you, Bernard Shaw. Total mood killer. Fuck you, Bernard Shaw. Total mood killer. Fuck, 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 fuck you, Bernard Shaw. Total mood killer. Total mood killer. Total mood killer. Embarrassed millionaire. Embarrassed and millionaire. Embarrassed and millionaire. Bazillion, 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 bazillion,